It was November 17, 1993. Joanne Rowling suddenly found herself homeless in Porto, Portugal, with just the clothes she had on at that very moment. To make matters worse, her four-month-old baby daughter was in the house of the man who had just thrown her out. Now, the relationship between her and her husband, Jorge, was tumultuous, and having a baby didn't make the situation any better or easier. Now, the breaking point came when she told him that she no longer loved him. She called a lawyer who urged her to retrieve her child no matter what. And when she arrived at Jorge's door, he told her that he did not want to talk to her. But Joanne could hear her daughter crying somewhere inside the house and placed her foot in the doorway so he couldn't close it. She repeatedly implored him to give her the baby and after a while, defeated, he gave up the child. It would be the beginning of a new phase, one that would be hard and difficult to get through, but also one that would push her to create what is now considered to be one of the most famous characters in modern literature. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, hard times, and devotion. I'm your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin. Join me as we explore the road to J.K. Rowling's most famous creation, Harry Potter. Quote, So given a time turner, I would tell my 21-year-old self that personal happiness lies in knowing that life is not a checklist of acquisition or achievement. Your qualifications, your CV, are not your life, though you will meet many people of my age and older who confuse the two. End quote. Well, having retrieved her daughter, who would keep her going when things seemed too difficult, Rowling's plan was simple. Step one was to escape Portugal and return to Great Britain. Once that was accomplished, she would need to find a place to live and soon thereafter a job, ideally something within teaching, which is what she did in Portugal until everything fell apart. With very limited funds, however, she could only rent a place for a few months. Given that her friends in London had moved elsewhere while she was in Portugal, she concluded it better to try her luck in Edinburgh, where her younger sister Di was living with her entrepreneur husband. Roger. Di welcomed her sister and niece, and since she always had the ability to look at the glass half full, she encouraged her sister to tell her more about this Harry Potter concept she was working on. Joanne had left Portugal with the first three chapters of the book, along with numerous notes for the rest of the book, as well as the remainder of the series, including its conclusion. Though being dedicated to the book, the priorities in her life had made writing difficult, and she barely had three completed chapters since she had first thought of the idea three and a half years prior. Di read those three chapters and was instantly hooked. Later, Joanne would explain that had her sister not laughed at the right times in the story, she very likely would have set aside the whole concept and never done anything with it. Well... Luckily for all Harry Potter fans, her sister did laugh at the right time. Wanting to stand on her own two feet, Joanne was not one to mooch off her sister, so she soon found an apartment of her own. Her money situation only allowed for a low-level apartment with a rodent problem. To make matters worse, she was forced to face a nightmare. Bureaucracy. With Christmas of 1993 just around the corner, she found herself in the office of the Department of Social Security, telling her story and the dire straits she was facing. She would later describe this ordeal as such. You have to be interviewed and explained to a lot of strangers how you came to be penniless and the sole carer of your child. I know that nobody was setting out to make me feel humiliated and worthless, though that is exactly how I felt. Well, what did she get for this grueling experience? Sixty-nine pounds a week, which was expected to help feed, 
clothe and house herself and her baby as well as cover the household bills. Suffice it to say, it was not easy to make those ends meet. For well, soon came the time she could no longer stand the sounds of mice scurrying inside the walls of her small apartment. So, swallowing her pride, she borrowed six hundred pounds from one of her best friends. But, unfortunately, it wouldn't prove easy to find a new apartment in her condition, since people were more than a little skeptical about renting to people on housing benefits. After dozens of failed attempts, finally... It seemed that a woman took pity on her, and that very same afternoon, Joanne accepted a one-bedroom, unfurnished apartment in the old port of Edinburgh. After her sister and friends lent her a few pieces of furniture, Joanne and her daughter moved into the apartment which would be their home for the next three years. In this tiny apartment, at the kitchen table, is where she would complete the manuscript for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Low on funds and being stuck in the apartment day in and day out, Joanne found herself slipping into a deep depression. One of the worst experiences had been when she paid a friend of her sister's a visit and saw the number of toys her son had. While in her own case, her daughter barely had enough toys to fill a single shoebox. That day, she cried her eyes out after returning home. The Dementors, which would appear for the first time in the Prisoner of Azkaban, would be cultivated during this time of her life. Of this, she would say, It is that absence of being able to envisage that you will ever be able to be cheerful again, the absence of hope, that very deadened feeling which is so very different from feeling sad. It was a truly bleak time for Joanne. During the summer of 1994, things seemed a little easier, and by coincidence or a stroke of luck, her brother-in-law had formed a partnership with a friend and bought a cafe called Nicholson's. A poverty made the prospect and desire of becoming a professional writer as strong as ever, and with Nicholson's as an outlet, she felt she had a place to sit in peace and quiet to write. So each morning, she would set off with her daughter in her stroller and walk the half hour it took to get to the center of town. And once her daughter was soundly asleep, she would walk over to Nicholson's and make her way up the twenty steps to the first floor trying to find a quiet corner table to work on her Harry Potter notes. Her brother-in-law's business partner would recall that Joanne would write everything in longhand, pen and paper, with numerous hours of scribbling. Now, stories of her and Nicholson's have now become a thing of legend. How she allegedly wrote notes with one hand while rocking her daughter to sleep with the other, and how she chose to write there because she couldn't afford to heat her apartment if she stayed at home all day, would add to the myth. Now, she would later reveal that the stories were only half true, while the other half was a fabrication, saying... It's true that I wrote in cafes with my daughter sleeping beside me. That sounds very romantic, but of course, it's not at all romantic when you are living through it. The embroidery comes where they say, well, her flat was unheated. I wasn't in search of warmth. I was just in search of good coffee, frankly, and not having to interrupt the flow by getting up and making myself more coffee. Ah, you gotta admit, though, those little fabrications... Add a little spice to it all. Adds a little inspirational flair. By the end of 1994, she managed to get some work as a secretary that brought in a much-needed additional 15 pounds, which was all she was permitted to earn before the state started to deduct the equivalent amount from her so-called benefits. The money made a great difference nevertheless, especially when it came to buying diapers. Still, every week she had to face the post office and Leith Walk where she would cash her benefit checks. Neither the scars of social shame inflicted on her nor the memories of the ugly comments directed at her as she waited in line would ever be forgotten. Alas, in the summer of 1995, she was finally able to get off the benefits, 
for good. A friend gave her financial assistance with her child care so that she could become a full-time student again and to get back to teaching, and she also received a grant that made it possible for her to make those ends meet. But there was one thing she needed to do to achieve full closure with her past. On June 26, 1995, this very thing she needed happened as her divorce became final and she was officially Joanne Rowling, once again, soon to be the world-renowned J.K. Rowling. There she was, looking for potential literary agencies, and as she was flipping through the writer's and artist yearbook in the Edinburgh Central Library, she came across Christopher Little Literary Agency. She liked the name and sent them her book, which was draped in a black plastic wallet. It was the second London agency she had tried. The first had sent back a rejection but did not return the black plastic, which annoyed her. It would be Brianni Evans who'd opened the mail containing Rowling's book at the offices of Christopher Little Literary Agency. The 25-year-old Evans had only recently began working at the agency as the office junior and had just the vitality which Rowling needed, though still, it wouldn't prove easy. Now, most scripts that would be submitted to the agency would go straight to the rejection basket, and considering that the agency did not handle children's books, Harry Potter being obviously targeted towards children, it went straight to the basket along with other discarded manuscripts. Christopher Little did not think of children's books as moneymakers. Now, Evan's job was to sort out the types of books they weren't interested in. However, she noticed the manuscript again around lunchtime on account of the unusual black plastic wallet draping it. She fished it out of the basket and gave it another look. Now, for all the diehard Harry Potter fans out there, thank you, Bree. Now, inside this black plastic wallet, there was a synopsis and three sample chapters, which was what the agency asked to be sent in as standard. The first thing Evans noticed was that there were illustrations along with the text. This was a nice surprise. There was one illustration of the titular Harry standing by the fireplace in the Dursley's house with his scruffy hair and the lightning scar on his forehead. Intrigued, she started reading the first chapter, which would be published practically unedited from the draft she read. The main thing that struck her, and the reason she became captivated by it, was the humor. Yes, that same humor that J.K.'s sister Di laughed at, giving her the signal to carry on writing. And Brianni Evans made it through that first chapter and was sufficiently impressed, prompting her to put the manuscript to one side, determined to finish the remaining two chapters later. At the time, the agency employed a young freelance reader, Fleur Howell, to look at the unsolicited manuscripts and to work with authors on those they liked to make sure they were of a high enough standard for submission to the publishers. Fleur came into the office that afternoon, and Evans passed over Rowling's manuscript. She told Howell how she had read the first chapter and considered it really good, and therefore wanted to see what he thought. After getting the green light from Howell, Evans asked Christopher Little if they could ask Rowling for the rest of the book, to which he replied, Yes, whatever. And just like that, things were in motion. Later, Evans would explain that the book wasn't a big priority yet, but that was far from how Rowling took it. Needing a win after having expected a rejection letter, she danced around the kitchen table after reading that they wanted to read more. She reread that letter numerous times. It was the best letter of her life. Worried that Christopher Little might change his mind if she stalled, the rest of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone arrived at the agency within a week. And Rowling didn't know at the time that Christopher Little had not yet read a single word of her writing. That would soon change, however. Now, Evans, ever the more excited about the book, sped through the entire story in a I-can't-put-this-down sort of way. Having assured herself that the quality was persistent beyond the first three chapters, she passed it on to Christopher Little, who also read it overnight. 
The next morning was full of enthusiasm, and they had only three or four points for Joanne to look over. One of these things was to develop Neville Longbottom a little more. Evans thought he was a lovely character and therefore just needed a bit more fleshing out. Christopher, on his end, was very keen on the game of Quidditch, which he thought should play a bigger part in the book. He also thought it would not appeal to boys as a game unless the rules were in there. Well, luckily, she had already written the rules but had taken them out of the story, so it was just a simple matter of putting them back in. Unfortunately, her money situation had not improved during the time she submitted her book and made the impression on the agency. Thus, she was forced to retype whole pages rather than pay for photocopying with corrections. Her talent was, however, undeniable, and the final manuscript, even after the required edits, would end being remarkably close to the initially written version. Briani Evans was satisfied with the manuscript, and Christopher Little presented Rowling with a contract with the company's usual terms, 15% of gross earnings for the UK market and 20% for film, US and translation deals. It was a secure but standard contract from the point of view of the agency, binding Joanne to them for five years and then rolling on year by year with a three-month notice period of quitting. Finally, the time had arrived for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone to be sent to a publisher. Brianne Evans was in charge of sending it out and prepared three versions, put a new title page at the front and stamped each one with the stamp reading, Christopher Little Literary Agency. Each copy, of course, wore the name Joanne Rowling, though that would soon be slightly changed. Now, Christopher Little had consulted people in children's publishing divisions and was told that, whereas girls would read books by male authors, boys would not pick up a book if the author was a woman. Well, whether correct concerning this or not, he told Joanne that the best strategy was to have her name on the cover of the book be initials plus a surname, J. Rowling did not seem substantial enough. Neither did J.R. Rowling, and J.R.R. Rowling was naturally discarded. After putting their heads together, though, they came up with J.K. Rowling. It flowed off the tongue, as two consecutive letters of the alphabet are prone to do, and Joanne, well, she liked the idea of adding her grandmother's name, Kathleen, to her own. All her life she had signed herself either Joanne Rowling or just J. Rowling. Now she would have to master the J.K. Rowling autograph without any idea of how many times she would be signing it. One can only imagine how many times that has been. Penguin Publishing became the first to turn it down. At Transworld, their reader was off sick, so it lay in a tray not getting read until Brianne Evans asked for it back so she could send that copy out into circulation again. All in all, about twelve publishers turned down the chance to publish Harry Potter. Then a copy of the manuscript was sent to the offices of Bloomsbury, where editors instantly found a quality they were looking for in the Philosopher's Stone. Now what struck them was that the book came with a fully imagined world, complete with characters, all of which it was clear Rowling knew everything about. The book was, however, very long for a children's book. Eventually, after about a month, Bloomsbury made an offer of £1,500 for the book. Now, Evans recalled that she called up HarperCollins, who had a copy of the manuscript, and told them that Bloomsbury was interested. Well, HarperCollins, in a decision one can speculate they would later deeply regret, told her that they didn't have time to put a bid together and for them to go with Bloomsbury. Now, Christopher advised Joanne to accept the offer, which she did with glee. And just like that, Bloomsbury secured what would be one of the best-selling literary pieces in modern time. And rolling on her end would wind up with £1,275, which was a small fortune for her. The money would be paid in two halves, one immediately, the other upon publication, which was scheduled 
for June of 1997. Bloomsbury then invited her to come to London to meet with everyone she would be working with, a trip she traveled in a single day in order to get back to her daughter as fast as possible. This meant sitting on a train for ten hours, but it gave her a chance to get some work in on her second book. Although things were very exciting and fun, the money situation was still a factor, and with the publishing date still a year away, she needed money to feed and clothe her daughter, especially now that she was no longer on benefits. Luckily, she heard word of a grant for authors by the Scottish Art Council. The two conditions for eligibility were that you were resident in Scotland and that you were a published author. Strictly speaking, she fulfilled only the first, but found a sympathetic ear in the literary director of the council. Soon thereafter, a letter arrived informing her that she had been granted the highest possible bursary award of £8,000. It was the largest single sum of money she had ever received. What would her first purchase be with her newfound fortune? A word processor. This purchase would put an end to laboriously typing and retyping on her old second-hand typewriter. Seven long years after being thought up on a train journey from Manchester to London, on June 26th, 1997, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was finally published. The hardback print run was 500 copies. It was Barry Cunningham of Bloomsbury who had commissioned the cover illustration personally. He wanted it to be approachable and charming, not too slick, but funny, reflecting the humor of Harry Potter. Thomas Taylor's illustration of a schoolboy with thick round glasses and a lightning bolt down his forehead standing in front of a bright crimson train bearing the sign Hogwarts Express was deemed the perfect fit. On the day the book was published, Joanne, well, sorry, J.K. Rowling, was so excited that she spent the whole day walking around Edinburgh with the book tucked under her arm. She told Barry Cunningham that it was like having a baby all over again. She would also tell that the first words her daughter said were, believe it or not, Harry and Potter and that, without any pressure from her, the three-year-old would shout them out in bookshops. Now, she was sure people would think she was actually making the baby do it. Did she? Well, I don't think so. Bloomsbury only had a small budget and was therefore unable to promote the book far and wide. Luckily, that would all change with some help from the American market. Within three days of being published, Christopher Little called Rowling. He was in New York and explained that there would be an auction for the book rights for the American market. Enter Arthur A. Levine, editorial director of Scholastic Books, who had read the book after being nagged into it. He was not the only American buyer interested in the rights, but he was the only one who offered a bid of 100000 U.S. dollars. That's 66,666 pounds for those of you used to counting the pounds. Later, he would tell the New York Times how scary it was to keep bidding when the stakes continually grew higher and higher, plus that it was the novel of an unknown woman in Scotland. With so much money invested into it, the book simply had to succeed. Looking back on that evening in an article she wrote for the Sunday Times, she recalled, I walked around the flat for hours in a kind of nervous frenzy, went to bed at 2 a.m. and was awoken by the telephone early next morning. It didn't stop ringing for a week. The first run of 50,000 copies were deemed to be a very optimistic bet, and many were doubtful that it would sell as much. It entered bestsellers charts at number 135, and just as in Britain, the popularity of the boy wizard skyrocketed. Two weeks after the publication of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, she delivered the manuscript for the second volume of The Boy Wizard's Adventures to her publisher. By the end of 1999, Harry Potter books occupied three of the top four places in the bestseller lists of that year.
Despite her tremendous success, Joanne has never forgotten the part Brianne Evans played in her success, evidenced by her being upset when a newspaper played down Evans' significance in an article. When she saw Brianne the next time, which was on the release date of the fourth Harry Potter book, she signed her copy writing to Brianne, who really did discover Harry Potter. I'll add to that. Thank you, Brianne, for taking that extra glance that no one else dared to at what would become a great pleasure for so many. As usual, let's end this episode with a quote, this one from the master magician herself. It is impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you might as well not have lived at all, in which case you have failed by default. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemore Harden. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash houseofwords or paypal.me slash houseofwordspodcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page at House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Cristo M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason and Moorharden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Cristo M. Sanchez and Jason and Moorharden.